Hello to everyone. Thank you for coming. We're going to be talking about practical Docker for OpenStack. And I just want to reach out a thank you to everyone that's here uh, at the last hour of the last day of the conference. And we have a packed room, so thank you. Um, so I'm not going to, uh, first of all, I'm Eric Windisch. Uh, I'm an engineer at Docker. And I am developing the, working on the Nova and heat drivers for OpenStack. So I don't want to bore you too much with what containers are. I don't think this room will be uh, nearly as full as it is if I had to explain what containers are. Uh, but uh, containers are lightweight and they're fast. Um, they run on a kernel. Uh, they're not on a hypervisor. So, um, they can be as fast or fast, well, maybe not faster, but um, as fast as running native on a system, right? Uh, there was actually a benchmark that said one time that they were faster and I'm not, uh, than native, and I'm not really sure how that happened, but um, we'll just ignore that anomaly. So, right, and what Docker provides um, on top of container technology is the solution, right? Uh, the solution for solving the problem of shipping code, deploying code, and running your code in all of these different places, all of these different clouds, from your laptop to your testing environment to your cloud or clouds, uh, including uh, your own local clouds or your uh, OpenStack clouds. Uh, again, either yours or uh, perhaps uh, a public cloud which you're deploying your code on. Right, so we want Docker provides something that allows you to have the sea of sameness, um, this mass production of these containers and services that they're homogenous and you can deploy them anywhere and they all look the same. Uh, and this isn't just the containerization and the technology uh, that Linux namespaces provides, but it's above and beyond that in the sense of the images and the uh, portability of those images uh, from one machine to another, and the ability of uh, the runtime uh, that wraps around uh, the namespaces that provides a consistent environment for them. Um, of course, in physical goods, uh, we had the <laughs> physical shipping container, and in Docker, uh, well, we have Docker for, for that on Linux systems. Or, or we seek it to be, right? So Docker allows you to have a way of um, running those containers uh, in a consistent environment. Um, let's see, um, above and beyond that, right, the, the fact that you can run them anywhere allows you to share them. So we have a way of, there's a global namespace of images uh, and an index of those images, a global index where you can download those and run them on your machine, you can share them with other users. Um, Docker Inc. itself, um, so first of all, Docker is an open source project uh, with over four or 500 active contributors, or, or contributors, I'm not sure how many are active, I'm not sure what the statistic is. Uh, we do have those. Um, but we have over 10,000 stars on GitHub, uh, et cetera. Uh, there's also the company, Docker Inc., from, for whom I work. And we have about 35, 40 employees. Uh, we have a Series B, et cetera. So use cases for Docker um, and even containers uh, in some respects are, first of all, uh, loosely coupled isolation. So the fact that they're not VMs and they're on the same kernel means that you can have these microservices that can share things between each other, such as network namespaces, uh, IPC namespaces, file systems, et cetera. So what you can do, potentially, is say that I am going to run two containers. Uh, each of these containers is running a microservice. The first one, uh, and I'll actually show this as an example in heat later, is an FTP service, and the second one is an Apache instance. Now, I'm not saying you should run FTP. But in this example, the one container, the FTP container only runs the FTP service. It has its own root file system, it has its own uh, network interfaces, et cetera. But you can upload files into that and have them immediately be available within the Apache instance, uh, or the container, rather. So doing this, you have a smaller uh, attack 
vector, right? You, you've, you've constrained uh, your attack surface for each of these containers because they're only running one service each, but then they can share things between each other um, by being, by the virtue of being on the same host. Um, We have uh, imaging, uh, iteration, and integration. So this is more of a test, staging, production cycle. Um, but I like, to, I like to use uh, words that start with I, right? Because it's this cycle. We can do all of these things with Docker. You can, you can run your code, you can build your code on your laptop, test it there, deploy it to uh, your CI systems, and then run it in production, all with, these, all with the same image. And this, is all the same environment. So for instance, I can do local development. Uh, so I have a project, um, actually uh, Paul Zazarski started this and I uh, stole it from him. Uh, he's in the audience here. And it's called Doc and Stack. And with that, I can run DevStack locally and run it really quickly, uh, make the changes that I want to in OpenStack, test them, submit them, and, and that code can potentially be the same code that runs in CI. Um, now, in this case, we're never going to run that in production because we're not going to run DevStack in production. But the fact that I can run the full suite of CI uh, testing suite on my laptop as opposed to some customized environment specifically for local development and testing is really powerful. Uh, we have the, so to continue on, we have the multi-cloud uh, use case, right? So we can take that image and we can then not only deploy it on my laptop and in my CI system, but I can deploy it on my cloud, and I can deploy it on your cloud, and it should be portable. That image will be importable and runnable in each of these environments. Excuse me? I forgot what the other... Uh... Oh, right, so alternative form of virtualization, right? So. There is the model where people want to use uh, Docker or containers to provide an alternative lightweight form of virtualization. And most of the users of this model seem to be, uh, uh, as far as I can tell, uh, mostly big data users, uh, people with very tight um, performance constraints, or people who simply don't care about some of the security aspects of running in containers. And it's a viable uh, model, and there are a lot of people that seem to be interested in doing this. Um, and it seems to be something that uh, will be used and supported in the Docker ecosystem to some extent. And then you have, well, and then scale up big data, which uh, is kind of overlapping, right, with, um, with that. But, these, but that's, that overlap, um, so actually I should probably clarify too that by using Docker on bare metal, um, for instance, as an alternative to Ironic, um, and not to say that one necessarily has to do that, right? But you could say use the Nova Docker driver as an alternative to Ironic for those that want to protect certain things and prevent their users from doing certain things on the host. Now, it may not be a complete isolation, but it allows you to say, well, this user can, uh, these processes cannot access these devices, right? There's a barrier there that makes it much harder to break out and do these things, such as accessing uh, GPUs or accessing firmware on the system, um, either the BIOS um, or the, the firmware on your Ethernet card. Uh, there are all kinds of attack vectors that once you give somebody access to the hardware, you can no longer verify uh, or c attest that hardware can now be safe for use for other workloads, especially in a multi-tenant environment, right? This is one of the great challenges in projects like Ironic, where they say, great, I just gave this user this hardware, now we don't know that we can safely put another tenant on it, it may no longer be safe. So putting, some, so putting containers there allows there to be a shim where we get that performance, but we don't necessarily give users access to break our hardware. So we're putting Docker in maybe not all the things, but in quite a few things, and uh, we've been put, Docker Inc., uh, we've contributed work towards OpenStack Compute, Nova, and Heat Project. But there's also been work in Solemn. Uh, we have uh, Adrian in the, in the audience, I see him. Uh, there he is. We have uh, Tempest in the Teacup, which is part of RefStack and the, the DefCore to try 
it's an image that you can run to verify a cloud that it works with um, the Docker, um, sorry, the OpenStack ecosystem, right, that it can use the OpenStack trademarks. And there's an image for that that wraps it all in Docker. And Crowbar has been using Docker as well. And it's not an OpenStack project, but it seems to be tightly enough coupled with the community that it's worth mentioning. Uh, <laughs> Uh, that was the solemn data plane if uh, <laughs> the slide somehow got in there. But uh, Docker is in Solemn, or used by Solemn. So I want to go over some of the heat integration. Um, with heat, you can use the heat resource for Docker to communicate through the Docker API. And what this does is it exposes a near raw version of the Docker API to the user where you can do just about anything that you can do with Docker and the Docker API, and orchestrate that via heat. What you'll see here in, the, in this picture, if I can, Nova is not used and connected here. Now, it's not to say that we're not going to use Nova, but the resource doesn't talk to Nova. Heat uses the resource to talk to Docker. And I'll show a moment, uh, in a moment an example of a heat resource where what we'll do is we're actually going to launch VMs in Nova and then uh, bring up Docker inside those VMs and use heat to orchestrate those Docker containers. And one of the great things with this model is that if you're using Ironic or Nova bare metal or even a hybrid cloud situation where perhaps you're using Rackspace, uh, there's, a, there's actually a resource for Rackspace where you could actually launch VMs in these other various environments and use heat to orchestrate them. Now, when I say Rackspace, uh, you could use that for orchestrating for AWS or GC or something else as well, but they actually don't currently have heat resources. Uh, if somebody wants to contribute something like that, that would be fine, and Docker would be able, the Docker resource would actually be able to deploy on those. So this is the heat workflow, right? So Nova, we use the Nova resource to deploy the VM and the Docker resource to communicate the Docker. And then Docker provisions containers. See if this works now. I think it's dead. I shouldn't have used the, uh, the light. <laughs> so what we do is we install the, we can install the plugin. Uh, this code should install the plugin. And once you do this, you would then restart heat and you'll be able to use the, uh, the plugin. It's not installed and used by default, unfortunately. Uh, perhaps we can convince uh, the heat community to do that, but until then, you install it and you can use it. So this is an example of a heat template. Uh, heat templates can be written two ways. They can be written in XML or YAML. Uh, for reasons of readability, I've chosen to use YAML. Uh, at top here, what we're doing is we're defining uh, first a resource called my instance. And this is a Nova server. So we're going to create a Nova instance. And we're going to give it an SSH key, so we're going to be able to get into it. And it's going to have an image, uh, which um, I'm just calling it Ubuntu Precise. You can use any OpenStack image. Uh, and this would probably be uh, even a UUID, right? Uh, that's in Glance. I wanted to give it some name that you can read. Uh, you specify the flavor. And user data is information that's fed into cloud init. And that's going to say, this thing should install and run Docker. Uh, you could use images that are already Docker built in and baked in if you, if you wish to. Uh, this is obviously uh, an example. Then we have a, another, Docker, uh, another resource, which we're gonna call my Docker container. So the resource names are arbitrary. And that's a Docker Inc. Docker container. That's the Docker resource, and we're gonna say this resource is going to talk to the Docker API on this IP address, and the IP address being that of my instance. And we're going to launch uh, a start a container there called Ceros. So this is uh, pretty much the, the most basic version of a uh, Docker work, uh, a heat stack using the Docker resource. So we're gonna make the, we're gonna, we're gonna bump it up a little bit, and we're gonna, we're gonna do dock and stack. So we're gonna do Tempest, we're actually going to 
test OpenStack in Docker on Nova using heat. <laughs> and doing that, it's, it's uh, not much different, right? We just say the image is going to be the doc and stack image. We're gonna say this is privileged, which actually means this is uncontained. So you can actually run uncontained images with Docker. So you can say, we're, we're not going to apply systems capabilities and so forth. We're going to use namespaces, but we're gonna open up the capability set. Um, and the reason you can do that, do that is for things like nested virtualization, which we're going to do in uh, OpenStack. Um, it, or rather to say, in Dock and Stack, right? Because we're gonna run Docker containers with Nova inside of Docker, inside of Nova, inside of Heat. <laughs> if, if anybody could follow that. So here's a slightly more practical example. Uh, and this is one of the use cases and why at Docker, Docker Inc, we've been telling people about the Heat plugin and why the Heat plugin is powerful. Because you can launch these microservices, such as FTP container and Apache container, and they are individually contained, but they're sharing a resource, right? They're sharing this slash FTP directory. And when you, you can upload files into the FT, to the FTP server, which is in its own separate container, and those files are now present from the Apache container. So you upload files, and suddenly they're on the web but they're on the web in a, running out of Apache in a different container, constrained with its own root user, its own processes, or its own process, uh, rather, right? Another interesting thing about this model and this a particular example is that FTP container is running Ubuntu, and the Apache container is running Fedora on the same operating system. Right, so we also have compute integration. Right? We have the Nova driver, and I understand that many people right, are already running Nova, and they, and they want Nova, and they want this Nova integration. You know, despite perhaps some of the limitations um, and lack of uh, container uh, extensions that currently exist, which I'll get over in a minute. But before I get too deep into it, I really wanna give thanks to a bunch of awesome people who have been helping make this thing better. Um, each of these people have been contributing in some significant way to the, to the Docker Nova driver, and I really thank you very much. Uh, so what is the Docker and what does, uh, sorry, what is the driver and what does it do today? And it allows you to control Docker via the Nova API and through that also via the Horizon, API, uh, Horizon UI. We can launch containers, we can terminate them, we can reboot them, get serial consoles. Um, we can also get logs, but it's not up here. You can do snapshots. We do have some integration with Glance, but it's not perfect. And recently, uh, maybe three or four weeks ago, we've gotten Neutron support, which is really amazing. So a little bit more about the networking, we have Nova Network, Nisera, Open Contrail, and Open vSwitch integration. And I just wanna add, uh, I actually had lunch with uh, James earlier today, and I was telling him that all of this code is uh, actually very generic for Linux containers, so we're probably going to try and see how much we can share with the other container technologies. and maybe accelerate uh, some of the feature growth uh, for those drivers. So things that aren't supported in the Docker driver, uh, cinder volumes, suspend and resume, pause, unpause, and live migration. Some of these are kind of hard. Uh, actually, pause and unpause, there's no reason we can't do that. Uh, the reason we don't do it is because we don't do it. <laughs> uh, adding it is just a matter of sig stop, uh, sig, uh, sig continue, and we could probably add that pretty quickly if we really wanted it. Cinder volumes is kind of hard because what we do is we operate on file systems and not block devices, and exposing those block devices into the container wouldn't even necessarily be so difficult as it would be useless because there's not much you can do with those block devices once you get them into the container because we can't give you the capabilities to mount those inside the container without breaking a lot of the uh, 
restrictions that we're using to actually prevent you from escalating to root. So it may be possible to provide solutions for that uh, down the road and not even necessarily that far down the road, but we're kind of punting that uh, most likely for the Juno release and um, perhaps we'll see what we'll get in the next release. A suspend and resume is really hard because if I think about trying to take a process, any arbitrary Linux process, and dumping it into memory, shutting down your machine, and starting up just that process, right? It's not just suspend and resume of your host, right? It's suspend and resume of a process on your host. And there are some, there's been some things that have, people have been working on making this possible over the last decade or so. And what happens is generally you can do this really well for a process that you build around that use case. You say, I want to build a process and an application that I can dump into memory and resume on reboot. You can actually do that. But to do that for arbitrary processes that you dump into arbitrary containers is something that we really can't do easily today. And if somebody wants to make that better, yeah, please. <laughs> um, and I should probably note that's kind of um, feeds back into the live migration story, right? Uh, for the same reason uh, that we can't dump the disk, we can't dump it across the network to another host. So what has changed uh, in the architecture, uh, just for reference, is we add the Docker uh, daemon, and so instead of using libvirt, when you use the Docker driver, you're talking to the Docker daemon that's on your host, and the Docker daemon talks to the Docker registry, which proxies to Glance. So images are stored in Glance, and Docker, the Docker daemon downloads them via the registry. So there has been some talk of, well, let me skip to the next slide where it just says what I said. Right, so this is controversial. This is probably my most controversial slide on here. So I've been making, having some thoughts about how to better integrate with Glance, and one of the thoughts I've had is that, is that Glance isn't really strictly necessary in our model, and it's not necessarily desirable. Um, as it is today, Glance is core and thus part of Def Core, and we must keep Glance in the model and in the system in order for an OpenStack cloud with our driver to actually be considered, to use the OpenStack trademark. So this is something that we're gonna have to figure out with the foundation um, and as to whether or not it makes sense to continue using Glance, if we want to continue using Glance, if we can stop using it, and what the ramifications of that would be. These are the things that Nova doesn't do, right? So we are saying that he is a better model for using Docker because we don't have container extensions yet in Nova. Nova doesn't yet do the things that make containers really awesome. Uh, linking container networks um, is kind of present through uh, security groups but we can't pass environment variables to the containers. So we can't say we're going to launch a process in a container and give it an environment, right? You launch processes, you wanna pass environment variables, especially with, for Docker containers where often they're defined in a generic way where we're going to say we need to make an Apache uh, container and we're going to pass it different configuration variable, uh, environment variables, or we're gonna give it specific conf uh, arguments. We're gonna say that this Apache process is going to configure a vhost using this domain name. And we're going to do that not by embedding that in the image, but we're going to make a generic image and then pass the information at runtime, right? These are things that you can do with containers that you don't normally do with VMs, that we want to be able to do in Nova or in uh, container extensions or container service down the road. Uh, we have the Docker volumes, right? We showed the, the volumes example earlier with FTP, right? How powerful is that, that you can launch these containers and, these, and, sh and share this information between them and that we just can't do that today? And this is just kind of a side note, right? So once you get those, um, those extensions, you're gonna want to have affinity. And you're gonna say, these containers do these things together, right? They're microservices, but they are, they're related. They're in different security domains, they're in different security con contexts, but they need to be together. We can only, this container only makes sense in the context of being deployed with that other container. So 
You can do this in Nova today, and you can do it by saying hint same host, and this uh, tells the same host filter for the filter scheduler to deploy on the same host as another instance, where the instance is this big, long uh, UUID. That's really great, except that it's also not very user-friendly interface. So I would like to really encourage the community to think about how we can make some of these, uh, U, the, the UX for this uh, better. So right, it goes back to the question, should I be using Heat instead of Nova? And the answer really is not one or the other. Well, I shouldn't say it's, it's not necessarily one or the other, it's just a matter of what is your use case, right? Do you need to use Nova? There, there are particular examples where, first of all, many of these extensions may in fact land in Nova eventually, uh, and there is an effort by the community, uh, especially amongst those with a vested interest in containers that are trying to push to get these things as extensions down the road. So from one, on one hand, uh, these things will probably come, on the other hand, you may say, I don't want or need these things. I don't care about doing this as microservices, or these things don't need to run uh, together. I'm going to use Docker for running my CI, and my CI is going to be like Dock and Stack. That's going to bring up this giant system and test it, and that's perfect for my use case, and that's all I want, and that's all I need, and absolutely Nova is great for that. But there are cases where you're going to want to use this forward-looking microservices model with linking services and leveraging these things out of containers that Nova just, at least for now, can't do. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about Dock and Stack. All right, so uh, Paul gets a slide here. Actually, he gets quite a few slides. <laughs> so we built Dock and Stack for testing because uh, at the time we were being told we had to do third-party CI. And I did not want to build a giant system that looked like OpenStack Infra. And not to say that I couldn't, but it seemed that there were a whole lot of pieces in motion here that were doing things that I could just dump into a container and run. And I could do those things and test them locally on my laptop, right? I can say, I wanna run DevStack on my laptop and make changes. I mean, how many times have I in, I, in the past, working on other features in OpenStack, and I've been working in OpenStack since almost the beginning, where I would take DevStack, or even before that, Nova SH, and I'd bring up a container, or a, a VM, and run DevStack, and then immediately snapshot that VM, because I, I'm gonna have to roll, I'm gonna make a bunch of changes, and then I have to revert and go back to where I was. And that's a process I had to do manually. And I had to wait over an hour to build that image or, or to get to the point where I could even do the snapshot, right? And Dock and Stack is this thing that runs, we can run it every day, centrally, and you can go online, you can just download this and run it locally on your machine, and it takes five minutes to run. From, from start to finish, five minutes to get a running OpenStack installation in DevStack that you can use for testing. And that's really powerful. And the great thing about that is that, at least for us, Right, that's the same thing that we're using for CI. So I'm going to test my code with Dock and Stack, and then I'm also going to use that for my CI. So instead of uploading your code so Garrett can grab it and run it in OpenStack Infra, and then find out that something was different from your environment and the CI environment, with Dock and Stack, that's not the case, right? It's completely the same thing from your laptop to to infrastructure. Now, unfortunately, OpenStack Infra is not using this yet, but I would like them to do so. Uh, so one of the other things about this, right, is that we're not doing nested virtualization. We're doing Docker in Docker. Um, or, right, so I also want to clarify, it's not necessarily Docker in Docker. It can be VMs in Docker. So you can actually do QEMU uh, or LXC or OpenVZ testing inside of Dock and Stack, which is really neat because you don't, now, you, you can make all the arguments you want about whether or not you should do nested virtualization or not, but it's definitely lighter weight, right? You don't have dedicated memory resources. There's no memory ballooning. There's none of these issues of, 
uh, the memory and uh, the nested virtualization uh, artifacts. I kind of covered all this information already um, about OpenStack Infra and how it kind of boxes everything up like a bento box. Okay. So I want to get a little bit into using Docker uh, with the compute plugin. This is the, the more practical aspect of how do you install the plugin. You check it out and you install it. You do pip install. And you set the, uh, the minimum you need to do at least is uh, set the compute driver. So there are a couple other configuration options. Uh, so there is the Docker registry. You can define where that is. Uh, by default, it's going to look uh, on each compute host for that registry. So you can deploy a registry on each host and it acts as a proxy. But you can centralize that, pro uh, that proxy and you can specify that as a host uh, for which I forget the config variable name. But you can look at the, uh, the help file. You, can, um, you would run the registry with something like this. Um, unfortunately, this is a lot of lines, right? But this is basically saying the, Docker, the registry has to talk to Glance, and in order to talk to Glance, it needs to know where Glance is, uh, how to log into it, et cetera. Um, also, the registry supports different backends, so you have to specifically tell it this is an OpenStack backend that we're running, uh, that we're going to be proxying to OpenStack. So you put images into your Docker uh, registry. Um, in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to pull the Cirrus image from the global index. And Cirrus image is actually uh, in what we call stack brew. So the Docker ecosystem has a set of official images that have been curated uh, by the community. And Cirrus has um, been, become part of that uh, curated set of um, standard library images. So you can pull the Cirrus image, and you can tag that image, uh, saying that this is going to, that this image, the upstream version of this image, is at uh, 10.001 uh, slash Cirrus. And that means that this is going to, when we do a push, it's going to actually push it and store that on that registry. And that registry is going to then push that image into Glance, and when we do a Docker pull, it's actually going to talk to the registry, and the registry is going to grab that data at a glance. So again, this integration with Glance is imperfect. Uh, currently, you can't actually push images to Glance and then have Docker understand what to do when you do a Docker pull. We're, again, we're looking at ways to solve that, and it's going to be a matter of uh, discussing this with uh, the, the right people in Glance and maybe even the foundation and so forth. Um, and this is actually, we're having a session tomorrow about the Docker driver and some of the features that are missing, and it's going to include, uh, to some degree, some of this, uh, the Glance integration feature that matters, right? So after you do all that, right, you can do a Nova boot. And when you do this, it works the same way as you boot any other Nova instance. And you, you pass your flavor and you pass your image ID, uh, which you get out of uh, Glance Image Show or Nova, uh, I'm sorry, Glance Image List or Nova Image List, uh, just like any other Nova container or <laughs> uh, instance. So I'm going to take questions, uh, but I just want to add that I did a, uh, a V brown bag earlier today where I'd actually do a demo, uh, which was about 11 minute demo, of actually running Dock and Stack. And it's just a matter of basically of uh, either building or downloading the Dock and Stack image and running it. So I will take questions. <laughs> uh, I've heard uh, CRIU is, is being used for uh, doing live migration and snapshots. Is that working or a work in progress? Um, I'm not sure about the, f the progress on that exactly. Uh, the thing with CRU is that there are, s I, my understanding is that certain things that we're doing in Docker don't map, um, aren't, don't work with CRU, and CRU doesn't work with all processes. So it is somewhat limited, and it may work for many processes, but it's, it won't work for all, and it's still uncertain 
at least to me, uh, whether or not it's going to work with containers because some of the kernel features that containers require don't necessarily work with CRIU. You do? Okay. Working on it, okay. Uh, so James Bottomley was just mentioning that uh, Parallels has been uh, testing it and have some progress maybe? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I know that there have been people at Docker as well looking at it. I'm just not sure what the status is. <laughs> okay, thanks. Uh, just one more question. Um, your Dock and Stack, will it boot actually like Docker containers and VMs that can uh, talk to each yes, other? Yes, yes. So it can, Dock and Stack can run Docker containers and VMs. Um, I've tested it with LXC, um, but we have had people that have reported that they've run KVM inside and it works. Uh, I just haven't personally been testing it. Uh, one of the issues that we have is that if you're using KVM currently, it wants to install libguestfs. And libguestfs does technically work inside of Docker, but the apt packages require fuse, which doesn't work inside of Docker. So when you install the, the packages for libguestfs, it installs packages that don't work inside of Docker. So it's slightly problematic. Oh, sorry. No, I meant, I didn't mean KVM inside of Docker. I meant like a Docker container running a, a, a guest talking to like something managed by libvirt outside of, outside of Docker. You're saying automatically having Nova launch KVM yeah. containers that run Docker inside? No, no, either like, like Nova Boot could run a Docker as a Docker container or run a glance image as a, as a KVM thing, like having two different kind of... Oh, so you're talking about a uh, multi-hypervisor Nova. So there is, uh, there has been work on, on multi-hypervisor Nova installs. And I believe that this works already today, but <laughs> if not, then it exists as a blueprint. <laughs> yes. So what does it mean for, what does flavor translate to for a container? So the containers actually do support uh, CPU weights um, or CPU shares and supports uh, memory limits. So you can say that this, uh, using C groups, it will say this process or processes cannot exceed uh, this memory limit. So. The, um, the, the, the flavor restrictions actually do apply to containers uh, equally. However, um, they are not, uh, like for instance, Zen, at least traditional Zen, uh, for which um, I'm actually fairly familiar, uh, I, would never, I would never use balloon drivers. I would say, I'm going, th this uh, instance is, or this, um, this VM is gonna have this much memory and it's not gonna be able to shrink or grow and uh, these processes in Docker are not actually uh, consuming that host memory, right? It's not fully allocated memory. It's just um, the memory that they're actually using is consumed. Are containers in integrated with Solometer? Um, you know, I've had conversations with uh, Nick Barset and some of the uh, Solometer folks, and to be quite honest, um, I'm not sure. So uh, they, I have heard that it's been looked at, but. I've not been personally uh, looking, it's not been really on the radar yet. And it may be something that comes up in the discussions in the design summit tomorrow, but considering that there are like big things missing, um, like features and testing uh, for the third party CI for reintegration into Nova, uh, I, have, I personally have higher priorities, uh, but if people are going to uh, test it and submit patches, then you're welcome to do so, because that would be great. More questions? If not, we can go home early because uh, it's the last day and I'm sure you would all enjoy that. Thank you.